regarding Samson. Hey, okay, Samson, we studied last week three minor judges, and we've been working our way through the book of Judges. We're up to Judges chapter 13. Uh, but first, as usual, my not-so-humorous humor that I put on here. Was that a sign for me? No. All right, here it is. There is a fine line between a numerator and a denominator. <laughs> also, only a fraction of the people will get this joke. A fraction of the people. What, does, what do dentists call their x-rays? They call them toothpicks. Huh? Isn't that good? I like that one. Uh, did you hear about the first restaurant? to open on the moon. The food was great, but there was no atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's jump into this. Here's a list of the judges again. I snatched this from one of my other sermons that we looked at this before, and we have worked our way through uh, these various judges. A couple weeks ago, I did Ibzan, no, last week, I did Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, the last one, notice that they got 13 and 14 because Eli, he was a priest. I don't know if he's considered a judge or not, but Samuel, he was uh, a priest, but he was also considered to be a judge. He judged Israel many years, but they are not included in this book. So I'm starting the last judge to be talked about. We have five chapters on Samson. Yeah, there's it four, four chapters on Samson. And then at the end of the book of Judges, um, there are a couple of really strange stories that kind of show the degradation of the, of the period at the end of the book. But we're going to take a number. Uh, I have five messages that we're going to be doing on Samson. This week we're going to talk about Samson's birth, his parents, his birth, his early growth. Next week we're going to talk about Samson's marriage. Now if I was to say to you... What is the name of Samson's wife? Almost every one of you would say Delilah. No, you're wrong. He never, he never married Delilah. We do not have that he was divorced, but his friend, his companion, it says, got his wife from her father. We'll talk about that next week or two weeks from now. No, next week Mickey's preaching, so in a couple weeks. But uh, chapter 14 is all about Samson's marriage. Uh, chapter 15 is about how Samson defeats the Philistines. That's who was oppressing them at this point. And then, uh, and then chapter 16, we have the story of Samson and Delilah. And then at the end of chapter 16, uh, Samson is brought by the Philistines into their temple to taunt him, and you remember the story there. So those are the five sermons that we're going to be working on on Samson, and then I have four more after that yet. All right, so here's my outline for this chapter, dealing with Samson's birth. First of all, Again, it talks about the conditions when Samson was born. What was it like when the Lord uh, brought birth to Samson? Secondly, we have a story where an angel of the Lord, and we've talked about the angel of the Lord in the book of Judges before, but the angel of the Lord appears to Samson's parents, verses 2 through 7, and then they were a bit, she began, did become pregnant, and they were kind of worried, and, and they prayed and wanted the angel of the Lord to appear again, explain a little more to them. So the angel of the Lord appears again to Samson's parents. And then we have uh, the angel, an important part of that exchange is the angel of the Lord. Well, I said this wrong. The angel of the Lord reveals his name. He really doesn't reveal his name. It was too wonderful for them to know. So he doesn't reveal his name to him. We'll talk about that. And then we have the birth of Samson, verses 21 through 25. Okay, so let's start out. Here's uh, point number one of my outline, the condition when Samson is born. Of course, he was brought along because the Lord, he was dedicated from birth uh, so you can imagine the conditions. What were the conditions like? Well, Israel, the people of Israel, again, 
again and again and again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. You know, you would think Israel would learn from history. Now, the book of Judges is, is probably 300 some years long. So it was different generations that wandered from the Lord. But if they'd only studied their history, they'd know that they would be punished for wandering from the Lord their God. But the new generations came along and they said, well, let's worship these idols around us. And, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Some comments I make here. Again, with the cycle of the judges, it's been through this book, the author purposely writes all about the cycle of the judges. They sin, they get under captivity, they repent, they pray to the Lord for help, the Lord raises up a judge, the judge really delivers them, and they have peace for a number of years until they fall away again. Remember that old cycle of the judges. So here, even with the last judge, we have the cycle of the judges again. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And all the way through the book of Judges, most of it has been that they worshipped other gods. They picked up the idols from the nations around them. That may not be the only evil that they did here. Corruption, immorality, uh, many times associated with the worship of the idols was, was prostitution and uh, things of that nature. So they, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. God gave them over to the Philistines. We looked at a chart before of all the various lands around the Israelites. And there were a number of times that uh, the Philistines became their oppressors. These oppressors were used of the Lord to turn the Israelites back to him. It was a long oppression. They had a pretty hard heart. They wouldn't turn back to the Lord. This oppression was 40 years long, an entire generation. They were under the captivity, the oppression of the Philistines. I mentioned here, notice it says, uh, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. One of the Lord's attributes. We have the omni-attributes. We have, oh, let me get them right, omniscience, omnipotence and omnipresent. Yeah, well this one has to deal with omniscience. The Lord sees, knows everything. The Lord knows exactly what was going on in their life. The Lord knows what you are doing even in secret when nobody else is around. That's important for us to remember. Point number two, the angel of the Lord appears to Samson's parents. Okay, so here we are. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites. So Samson came from the tribe of Dan, whose name was, we're going to talk about after we get through this series on Samson, uh, the Danites play an important role in those last couple stories at the end of Judges, um, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren. I have skipped a number of verses in here as we go along. But, and the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not, and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean, according to the ceremonial law of Israel. Eat nothing unclean. Uh, I skip a little bit here, but no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite. We're going to look at those verses, but back in the law, the Lord made uh, the option, if somebody wanted to dedicate themselves to the Lord, they could become a Nazarite, take the Nazarite vow. Well, here, it's from, from the womb, it's from birth. He was a Nazarite to God from the womb. Again, some, some uh, comments. Samson's birth was of the Lord. The Lord came to Samson's parents and prophesied that she would give birth to a son. By the way, the angel of the Lord. I know, we've talked about the angel of the Lord, but appears a number of times in the book of Judges, 
Most Bible scholars believe, it's kind of strange because it calls it an angel of the Lord, and angels are not to be worshipped, but many times as an angel of the Lord, the people worship, and the angel of the Lord accepts worship from people. So um, the angel of the Lord is considered to be, you know, one of the persons of the Godhead, the second person of the Trinity, uh, comes down pre-incarnate, pre-Bethlehem, uh, and um, takes upon the form of a person. A little later on, the wife is going to call him the man of God, thought he was a man of God until he went up to heaven in the cloud of smoke. Um, but the, the Lord came to Samson as the angel of the Lord, Samson's parents, and prophesied that she would give birth to a son. He was to be from birth a Nazarite. He was to drink no alcohol and not cut his hair. Okay, Those are kind of the two. Uh, not only alcohol, but nothing from the grape. So even grape juice was not supposed to be taken by the Nazarite. Samson's parents were visited, I mentioned here, by the angel of the Lord. This person appears throughout the Old Testament and is often considered to be a pre-incarnate yeah, here's that point. I was going to say this point, and I said it earlier, and, and here I have it in here. Pre-incarnate visit from the second person of the Trinity. Now, I say the second person of the Trinity because some of the, some of the texts talk about how he, the angel of the Lord, brings the message to the Lord. Well, how can that be? If he's the Lord, how can he bring the message to the Lord? Well, you get the Trinity involved there. Okay, Nazarite, from Wikipedia. I went to that wonderful scholarly site, Wikipedia, again, and I copied this. Yes, I, I'm, I am acknowledging my plagiarism. No, it's not plagiarism, because I'm acknowledging my source. A Nazarite is one who voluntarily took a vow described in Numbers. We're going to look at, not that whole chapter, but we're going to look at number six, some verses out of that in just a minute. This vow required the person during this time to abstain from all wine and strong drink. Strong drink in the Bible referred to alcoholic beverages. Refrain from cutting one, uh, the hair on one's head, but to allow the locks uh, of, the, of the, his hair to grow. Boy, that Wikipedia, there. <laughs> did I do that? Maybe I did that. Not to become ritually impure by contact with corpses or graves, even those of family members. I kind of smile because Samson certainly came in contact with some, some bodies. But, but Samson was to be... A Nazareth, usually it was voluntary for people, you know, who hadn't been a Nazarite to, at a certain point in their life, take the Nazarite vow. You might say kind of like a, a nun taking the vow to become, you know, dedicated to the Lord in a very special way. Um, but Samson's is a little bit different. His is from prophesied by the Lord and was from birth. Cross-reference, here's the number six. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, not Nazarene. Nazarene in the New Testament was people from Nazareth, but this was a special vow they called the Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord. He shall separate himself from the wine and strong drink, he shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink and shall not drink any juice of the grapes or eat grapes, fresh or dried. So he didn't get to eat raisins, anything that had to deal with, with, uh, with grapes. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. Now notice that it says, all the days of his separation, implying that he could take this Nazarite vow for a certain period of time. Maybe a certain year in his life, he would take the Nazarite vow and specially dedicate himself from, to the Lord. It could end at a certain period of time. But again, 
Samson's was a little bit different. The Lord was choosing him to be a Nazarite from birth. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head. You remember the end of the story of Samson? We'll get to that. Until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. He shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow long. All right. So there's, there's Numbers chapter 6. <clears throat> All right, the angel of the Lord appears again to Samson's parents, verses 6 through 14. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God, notice that he, this is the father praying, his wife had come to him and she says, I don't fully understand what I got to do. So Manoah prayed and let the man of God whom you sent come again. They considered that it was probably like a prophet, a man of God, a normal man of God had come to them. They're going to find out a little different here. Whom you sent, come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And Manoah said, now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? They wanted to know more about this special child they were getting. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, so the angel of the Lord comes back again, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She, talking about the mother, may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. All that I command her, let her observe. So I've skipped a few verses in there, obviously, but the angel of the Lord came back and gives them further instructions. Interesting, the angel of the Lord now talks about the mom. Hey, uh, so that's some of the comments. The first message was very brief, at least the parents felt it was. They weren't exactly sure how to, how to take care of this special child, so they prayed for this uh, man of God, this angel of the Lord, to come back again. So they prayed the angel of the Lord would come back again and give them more instruction. God granted this request. Even the mother was not to touch any strong drink with a baby given as a Nazarite. Of course, in, you know, we have a lot of medical knowledge. We have uh, babies who are born as crack addicts because the mom was a crack addict. Uh, the blood systems of the baby are intricately, intricately related to the blood systems of the mother. And things pass from the mother to the baby. Uh, mothers of, uh, babies of alcoholic mothers have problems from birth. We know that. Well, here the mother was not even to touch any strong drink. Uh, for, because of the baby, the baby Nazarite that was in her womb. That was special instruction given to him. I say here, God has dedicated Samson from birth to his service. He was going to serve the Lord. And he, we'll look at that later. I won't rob some of the other thunder from the other sermons. But you know the life of Samson. Though for, as a child, from, from conception, he was dedicated to serve the Lord. I say here, we need to consider ourselves dedicated to the Lord as believers. Here's probably the crux of my whole message, the main point of my message. Romans 12, verse 1. Many of you can quote Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Dedicate them, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We as believers are to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. Our time is the Lord's. Our Abilities and talent belongs to the Lord. Our thought life belongs to the Lord. All of these are to be dedicated in our life to the Lord. Jesus Christ has gone to the cross to redeem us. 
And we need to, when we become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to dedicate our lives to him. Not considering it to be our own, Paul says, because we are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body and your spirit, he says. This is an important New Testament verse. Just like Samson was dedicated to the Lord, we need to be dedicated to the Lord. I got a smile when I think about Samson's life because the next verse talks about, you remember Romans 12, 2, um, that we are not to uh, allow the world to conform us, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by God. Well, if anyone was conformed to the world, it was Samson in his life, you know? He was dedicated to the Lord, Romans 12, 1, but he did not, this is, I was going to talk about this later, but I'll bring it out now. Samson was dedicated to the Lord, but he was missing the element of holiness, living a holy life to the Lord. He got together with prostitutes, he did he, all kinds of things. We're going to talk about that in the coming weeks. But even though he was a Nazarite, and the Lord honored him, the Lord gave him supernatural strength from the Spirit of the Lord, uh, but he lived a very worldly uh, life. Paul says we need to dedicate ourselves and our bodies to the Lord. Point number four. The angel of the Lord reveals his name. Now, I got that wrong. I didn't say that right. They asked for his name to be revealed, but he really doesn't reveal his name. Let's look at the text here, what I'm getting at. Verse 17, I skipped a couple verses there. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, they're still talking to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? Remember, they thought he was a man of God. They thought he was a, a prophet of God, a human being that had come to them. So he says, what is your name? And then the angel of the Lord said this, the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Now, this is translated as wonderful. We're going to talk about that particular. Notice it is not capitalized, and it is not, you know, put in quotes. And the angel of the Lord here is not saying, Well, my name is wonderful. Now, that's not the way it is. He's saying... Uh, why do you ask that? Seeing my name is, we'll talk about that. For next verse, 19. So Manoah took a young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock of the Lord to the one who works wonders. Huh? That, so the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching and when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. So they all of a sudden realized, whoa, this wasn't a man of God. This was something more than just a man of God. And they realized who this was. So kind of an important point here that he says, you know, why do you ask my name seeing that my name is Wonderful. So here, here's some of the other translations. I always, I have from the ESV there, some of the other translations. New International says, he replied, why do you ask me my name? It is beyond understanding. And that, that Hebrew word that's used there, you see is translated a little bit different here. The, here the angel says, I can't give you my name. It is beyond understanding. Um, the New Living Translation, we know is a little bit of a paraphrase, but I think it's got the good meaning here. Why do you ask my name? The angel of the Lord replies. It is too wonderful for you to understand. I think that's what the angel was getting at. New American Standard Bible, NASB, which is considered a very close, baldly literal translation. But the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Pretty close to the ESV there. Uh, King James, different word entirely. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why askest thou thus after my name, 
seeing it is secret. You gotta, you gotta realize, you know, the couple of words that their meaning has changed a lot through time. Language changes through time. We have the word awesome. Our God is an awesome God. Well, that has become, a, a, you know, a very trite, oh, that's awesome, man. You know, we use that word all the time. But it literally means to be filled with awe at something. To, to, to consider it just so awesome that it, that it, that it stuns you. We have kind of lowered the meaning of that word. Same thing with the word wonderful. Wonderful means to be filled with wonder. Uh, we, a week ago, we, two weeks ago, we went out to um, Yellowstone and to see some of those sites on top of the mountain and see that view of, of out there and to see the mountains. And, and I'll tell you, it just caused us to be filled with wonder seeing those sites. Well, that's what he says. My name is, is just too much for you. It will cause you to be filled with wonderful. To, it will cause you to be filled with wonder. So he doesn't really give him their na his name. Okay. Now, cross-reference. An important cross-reference because he did reveal his name. This is with Moses when God is calling Moses and Moses says, you want me to go back to Egypt and lead the Israelites out of slavery? Who shall I tell them sent me, he says. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? This is an important revelation from the Lord way back in the book of Exodus. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. So he does give Moses his name. His name, the great I am. God, said to, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. I want to point out something here to you. I think I got, I got, I got this. You see this word right here. It is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Okay, whenever you see that in the Old Testament... It is not the word that means, you know, your master, your Lord. That is capital L, small o-r-d. Comes from the Hebrew word Adonai, which means master, okay? This is not that word. This is a name that the Lord is regularly called in the Old Testament. It had no vowels associated with it because the Israelites wouldn't put vowels with it because it was too holy of a name. It was the word, you've heard it before, it is the Hebrew name Yahweh, and that's putting some vowels with it, you know. Um, and that is related to the verb, uh, oh, quit it, I hit the wrong button, that's related to the verb, I am. Yahweh is a form of the verb, I am, meaning the eternal one. I've always existed. I stand outside of ta time. I am the great creator God who has caused and brought about everything. Um, a wonderful, too, a, a name that is too wonderful for us to understand, going back to, to Samson. Um, so the Lord revealed his name to Moses here, and he said to Samson's parents, my name is just too wonderful for you to understand. And then he goes up in the cloud of smoke up into heaven and they realize, whoa, this wasn't just a man of God. This was uh, Jehovah God. This was the Lord. By the way, we got, we got our English word Jehovah, which is a form of Yahweh. We have added a syllable because Adonai had three syllables. And, and when we made that name, we kind of merged Yahweh and Adonai. But, but Yahweh is kind of close to the Hebrew 
for the name of the Lord. I've told this story before. I remember some years ago. I don't know if I ever told it here, but when I was in seminary, my seminary professor, my Hebrew professor, had studied Hebrew in Jerusalem University. That was kind of unique. He had gone over and studied Hebrew in Jerusalem. And one day they had asked him to read the scripture in Old Testament scripture in, in the Hebrew. That was their practice so that they would learn Hebrew. And he stood up and he started reading and he came to the Lord's name and he pronounced it, Yahweh. And he said, the whole class got very, very quiet. And when he got done reading, his professor said, um, Mr. Roland, he wasn't Dr. Roland at that point yet, uh, when we come across the name of the Lord, we do not read that. It's so holy to the Israelites that they don't even read his name. They usually stick in something like Hashem, the name. That's the Hebrew word meaning the name. So they say Hashem. They substitute for it. As we have done, we call it the Lord. We have substituted, so we're not trying to pronounce the name of, of Yahweh. Okay? All right, let me go on. Enough to that. But, interesting, they picked up, then they wanted to know the name of the Lord, and he wouldn't tell them because it was too wonderful. Here, that word wonderful perked my interest. You know this Christmas passage, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, here it is, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So here in Isaiah, it does call him Wonderful Counselor, a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ coming. That is the same word, that word there is the same Hebrew word that's used back there in Judges, our text that we're looking in Judges 13. Okay, point number five, the birth of Samson. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in, and there's the name of the town, uh, Mahana Dan, because Dan meaning that was the tribe it was in. So the town of Mahana. Uh, between Zora and Eshtul. Do I have no? I guess that's the end of it. So he was born. They named him Samson. But notice the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He was dedicated from birth. The Lord caused her conception. He was to be a Nazarite. And the Spirit of the Lord, even at his young age, as he starts to grow, the Spirit of the Lord is on him. His name, interesting, his name, uh, here's the Hebrew meaning the sun man, comes from the Hebrew word uh, shemesh, which means sun. I have to remember a few weeks back when Jephthah had conquered the fords of the river and the Ephraimites were coming to go over and he gave them the word, um, oh, I've forgotten the word. What was the word? Shibboleth. Shibboleth. And they couldn't say it. They would say Sibboleth. And I showed you a little video I'd snatched off of YouTube talking about the two Hebrew letters Sin and Shin. Well, the name, and they even used Shemesh as the example for Shin, okay? So his name comes from the sun, Shemesh. But we in English lose the H sound and we call him Samson. We, we give it the sin. We must be Ephraimites because we call him Samson and we don't call him Shamson. You know, we, we lose the SH sound there. So his name means son. Uh, Samson mother gives him this name. He was not, the, we don't have any recording that the angel of the Lord gave him a name for her to call him, but she named him Sam. <coughs> Excuse me, Samson. Some, I was reading, and some have conjectured that she was worshiping the god of the sun. One of the Philistines' gods was a god of the sun, so she named him Samson. But the angel of the Lord had come to them and prophesied this. I think they turned from their idols and they were worshiping the true god. Um, 
But this does not seem right, especially since the angel of the Lord had visited uh, these parents. Probably did not get it from, from their idol worshiping. But they thought it was a good name and they chose the name Samson to call him. The spirit of the Lord began to be with him and stir, that's the word that's used in our text, him, as he grew up. Now again, as we will see in the coming weeks, the spirit of the Lord was with him. The Lord gave him supernatural strength. The Lord answered his prayer, especially that one at the end when he kind of repented. But the element of holiness seems to be missing in Samson's life. I guess I take from that, isn't it nice to know that the Lord isn't going to abandon us the first time we goof up, you know? Uh, we're to confess our sin, we're to get our relationship right with the Lord, and the Lord will be faithful and merciful to us and stay with us. Okay, here's my conclusion. Samson's birth was special. The Lord was going to be with him. From birth, he was dedicated to the Lord. And the point I made, uh, well, he was to be a Nazarite from his birth, meaning his parents needed to practice the requirements of this special vow uh, in, in the Old Testament. Even his mother was not to take strong drink. They were not to, you remember when a child gets, what, two or three in his hair, a, a, a baby boy, Maybe gets two or three and his hair starts getting long. His first haircut is always quite an event. Well, Samson wasn't supposed to do that. His parents weren't going to give him a haircut. We, as New Testament believers, we need to dedicate our lives to the Lord's service. To keep our lives pure from sin and to consider what we have, our time, our talents, our life, our thoughts, our possessions, to consider them belonging to the Lord. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. All right. Let's close our sermon in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for reaching down, touching our lives, bringing us to the cross, saving us. Father, May we dedicate our lives to you, realize that we belong to you. Thank you, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.